Um, it's my pleasure to um, introduce now, I think someone who probably needs no introduction to this uh, community. Uh, David Fagenbaum is um, a uh, physician scientist at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the co-founder of the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network, as well as Every Cure. Um, I just want to tell uh, my story of how I first met David. It was about six years ago, and I was uh, on my way to CZI. I hadn't quite started yet. I was starting in about a month, but I knew I was on my way to CZI, and I was thinking, what am I going to do at CZI? And I was really interested in rare disease, and I'd heard this guy, David Fagenbaum, was a really interesting story. I'd been hearing this for like a couple of years and read about him, and so I was so excited that he was speaking at Faster Cures. And um, so I was sitting there like, you know, maybe in the front row, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm excited to hear his story. And when I heard his story about the incredible progress he had made in this disease while he was literally dying from this disease, um, I was absolutely blown away. Like I'm sure so many of you who have heard his story were. And um, I was blown away on several levels, but one of them was that he had this idea, that he had this, the wherewithal during this time when he was sick and trying to understand what was going on with his disease, to realize that the most important thing he needed to do was to build a community, that he had to get these, the few researchers around the world to actually talk to each other and to start rowing in the same direction and to agree to a prioritized research agenda. And I just hit me like a light bulb. I was like, oh my God, why is it that every rare disease doesn't have a patient-led collaborative research network? And I went running up to him after the meeting, which some of you know, sometimes when I get an idea, like I'm like, oh my gosh, that's what I wanna do. And I went up to him and I was like, David, you don't know me, but I'm so inspired and I wanna figure out how to do this for other rare disease communities and will you help me? And he said, absolutely. And that was the start of an incredible partnership over the last six years. And David, thank you so much for everything you've done um, to inspire me, to inspire CZI, to inspire this program, this community. We wouldn't be here. I think I think it's fair to say we might not. This might not have happened if I hadn't met you that day. So, thank you. <laughs> What an incredible introduction and to hear um, those kind of words from Tanya. Um, before I get into my talk today, um, I did want to reflect on something that a lot of us say when we talk about rare diseases. We often say, rare disease is the family that none of us chose to be a part of. And that's true for most of us in this room. But it's actually not true for Tanya and for the CZI team. This is the family that they chose to be a part of. They could have done anything with the resources uh, from CZI. They could have gone in a million different directions, but they actually chose to be a part of our rare disease family and also to build the house for our rare disease family, right? I mean, this is, this is amazing. So, so a huge thank you to Tanya and to the entire CZI team for, for everything they've done. And, and truly, I, I remember um, that talk in Boston, and I remember um, Tanya coming up to me afterwards, and I remember um, some of the time we spent going through what we were doing with Castleman's, and it was just a dream of mine back then um, to be able to partner with an amazing group like this, to be able to spread some of the things we were doing for Castleman disease to other rare diseases. So um, big thanks to, to Tanya and the team. So today, I'm going to be sharing about the journey going from chasing my cure um, to try to find a drug that could save my life to this new initiative called Every Cure, so chasing our and every cure. Um, this is a very personal topic for me. Um, this is a picture of me while I was in the intensive care unit as a third year medical student at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, right around the time this picture was taken, my doctors came into my room and told my family and I that they had tried everything and there was nothing more that we could do. And I was so sick because all of my organs were shutting down, I didn't really understand what my doctors meant. And then other family members started coming into the room to say goodbye to me and then a priest came into my room and read me my last rites. I was 25 years old at the time. Just six months earlier, I was a former college quarterback and, and a medical student at the University of Pennsylvania where I'd been training to become an oncologist in memory of my mom. My mom passed away from cancer when I was 19 years old um, in my sophomore year of college, and, and 
when she became diagnosed and then watching her battle inspired me to want to dedicate my life, everything I have, to trying to find treatments for patients like my mom. And I was well on my way when out of nowhere I became suddenly and critically ill with a disease called idiopathic multicenter Castleman disease. Basically your immune system becomes hyperactivated and then starts to attack and shut down your vital organs for an unknown cause. Um, there are about 5,000 patients diagnosed each year in the US with Castleman's and um, most of us don't survive more than a few years after diagnosis or at least most of us didn't used to survive more than a few years after diagnosis. Um, but thankfully we've been able to make a lot of really important progress. In a last ditch effort to save my life, my doctors gave me a combination of seven different chemotherapies and somehow I survived. Um, just to tell you how sick I was, I actually felt better with every dose of chemotherapy, adromycin, cytoxin, etoposide, velcade, dexlidomide, but that combo actually started to destroy my disease and I started to feel better. Um, I was able to leave the hospital after spending about six months hospitalized, return to medical school, um, get back on this uh, mi mission of trying to develop drugs for, for patients in memory of my mom, um, and then I relapsed again. And uh, what was so difficult about that relapse was that I was on an experimental drug. I was part, Castleman's is part of the fortunate few rare diseases where there actually was a drug in development and there was a clinical trial going on and I got on that drug and that drug was supposed to be the solution um, but unfortunately it didn't work for me and we've subsequently learned that it doesn't work for about two thirds of patients and so that thing that we've been hoping for and praying for and wishing for, um, it, it was, you know, I was received the drug but then it didn't actually work for me and so um, like pretty much everyone in this room, I realized that um, my only chance for a future and the only chance for other patients uh, with my disease for a future would be to get involved in fighting back against this disease. And um, we wanted to do it uh, in a couple ways that were different from the way things were being done for Castleman. So one was what Tanya mentioned earlier, and that's that we wouldn't just raise money and then invite researchers to apply for the funding to use it how they wanted to use it, which was sort of the typical approach for research. We would build a community of physicians, researchers, and patients, and we would prioritize and crowdsource the most important research ideas, and then we would go out and recruit the best researchers, even outside of the Castle Disease community, to actually do the work. And so um, when you do it that way, you go from hoping that the right researcher applies for the right project at the right time to determining what is the right project and then who is the right researcher to do that project for you. That was one major fundamental pillar of what we would do with Castleman's. And the second pillar was that I knew that we didn't have a billion dollars in 10 years to develop a new drug from scratch. So from the very beginning, we said we are not gonna go on this mission to develop a new drug. We are gonna go on a mission right now to understand what is going on in Castleman patients, in our immune systems and in our bodies and then we're gonna look for already FDA approved drugs to see if any of those drugs can actually fix the problem that we're facing, and you know, so-called drug repurposing. But for us, um, we knew that was the only chance that we had for survival. Um, and uh, this picture on the left you can see was um, from right around the time that I relapsed and um, when I got uh, this multi-agent chemotherapy. And that was when my doctor explained to me that uh, we were out of options, that no more drugs in development, no more promising leads, the only drug that uh, was under any sort of study hadn't worked for me. And that's when I turned to my dad, my sisters, and my girlfriend at the time, Caitlin, and I promised them that I would dedicate the rest of my life, however long that may be, to trying to find a drug um, for this disease. And so uh, I unfortunately relapsed again about a year later um, after starting the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network and, and doing uh, Castleman's research on my own samples. I relapsed, um, but this time I'd been storing blood samples on myself every couple weeks leading up to that relapse. And so I got the same seven chemotherapies again, um, and when I got out of the hospital, thank thankfully with the chemo, um, I went to the lab and started performing a series of experiments on my blood samples. Um, and from those experiments, serum proteomics, flow cytometry, and immunohistochemistry, um, picked up a, a couple signals in my immune system that I thought maybe we could direct a drug at. So one was there were a number of cytokines that were elevated, um, a number of growth factors like a vascular endothelial growth factor, which causes blood vessel growth. And the final one was T cell activation, one of the immune cells in your body, which is highly activated in my particular case. And so we wondered, was there some sort of final common pathway that was involved in all of these things that maybe we could target a drug against? And so went back to the proteomics data um, and picked up a really strong signal 
that a particular communication line in the immune system called mTOR, which is really important for T cells to become activated, it's important for VEGF to be produced, it's important for immune cells to communicate with one another, seemed like it may be activated or maybe elevated. Um, and so uh, this was um, really exciting at the time because there are already FDA approved mTOR inhibitors. So we thought, well, if mTOR is the problem, maybe we could try an mTOR inhibitor. Um, and so I did a final experiment <coughs> On, um, on my lymph node, but I started out by looking at some other lymph nodes to see was mTOR actually up? Was there increased activation of this pathway? This is a normal lymph node, and you can see brown is positive and blue is negative. Um, you can see in a normal lymph node, some of the cells do have this communication line turned on. Um, and then we stay in my lymph node, and we're just totally blown away by the tremendous amount of mTOR activation in my lymph node. So this made us think that maybe blocking mTOR um, could be an effective way to treat the disease. And so um, serolimus, uh, or rapamycin, um, was discovered about 50 years earlier on the island of Rapa Nui. Um, it was developed as a drug for kidney cancer and also for organ transplant rejection. It had never been used before for Castleman disease, um, but here I was armed with data that made me think that mTOR was important to Castleman's, and here we are with an mTOR inhibitor, so, and here I was having failed all other options and, and literally soon to die, um, and so I talked to uh, my doctor about this idea of trying um, this mTOR inhibitor, and, um, you know, we had no other options, and so he agreed to give it to me, and, um, I, I've now been in remission for over nine and a half years on this drug. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. So for over nine and a half years, um, I've been on this mission now to say, okay, if this drug is working for me and if this process of finding a drug that was made for another disease could help my disease, how can we do this for more people? During this mission, I got married to the girlfriend of mine that I mentioned, Caitlin. Um, we had two beautiful children, Amelia and David. Um, of course, uh, as I think about my time in the ICU, I never could have imagined um, a future a family and, and that I would be here with all of you, and I feel so grateful for it. Um, the New York Times called this Doctor Cure Thyself, which I think is a bit of an overstatement. I think it should be Doctor Helping Himself a little bit right now and hopefully for a lot longer, um, <laughs> but uh, I don't think that would have fit. Um, uh, during this remission, um, I also joined the faculty at Penn to launch a center to do this kind of work at scale and also wrote a book about my journey chasing my cure. I hope you guys all, um, all grab a copy. Um, so through our work over the last nine years, we've been laser focused on uncovering what is causing hyperinflammatory diseases and then what already FDA approved drugs can fix these problems, you know, drugs that are already on the pharmacy shelf. Um, and these are pictures of eight patients that are alive today because of a drug that wasn't meant for their disease. And there are many more, but these are some of, some of my favorite patients. Just got to see one of the patients on the screen just a couple days ago. Um, but they are alive today because of a drug that wasn't made for their disease. They aren't supposed, I'm not supposed to be alive, they're not supposed to be alive within our current system, but we uncovered a new use for the, for the drug that's saving their life and they are, they are with us today. Um, one of the discoveries that we made um, is around a drug for a rare cancer called angiosarcoma that I thought I'd highlight just because it's, it's one of my favorite examples. Um, and that's because there was a study that was done and published in 2013 um, that suggested that a particular uh, immune axis called PD-1, PD-L1 was increased in a few patients with angiosarcoma. Published in 2013, angiosarcoma, when it's metastatic, is uniformly fatal. Um, and for three years, no one had done anything with that information. It just sat in the published literature. Um, and three years later, a patient came to us um, with metastatic angiosarcoma. He had failed to respond to all chemo um, and said, you know, I heard that you're on this repurposed drug. Like, could you help us find something? And um, we found this study from three years before and said, well, why don't we test your tumor to see if it has increased PD-1 expression? And, and it did, in fact, have increased PD-L1 expression. Um, and so we started him um, on a PD-1 inhibitor for, at the time, what we believe to be the first time ever um, with this disease. And um, he's been in remission for over seven years on this PD-1 inhibitor. Yeah. And, and one of the things that makes me so excited about this process is so getting Michael on this drug, um, he went to his doctors, MD Anderson, and they started treating other patients with angiosarcoma with it. And now it's standard of care. It's actually recommended by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, and there are clinical trials underway. But even before the trial's been finished, it's such a horrible disease that because it's saving people's lives so obviously, people are just getting it, and now it's standard of care. And so for me, this is one of my favorite examples because the data was out there. It required no brilliance whatsoever. All we had to do was find someone else's work get it to a patient, and then now it's saving thousands of lives all over the world. So, so these are the kinds of things that keep me up at night, is how many more of these breadcrumbs are sitting out there that we just need to find. 
So um, one of the things that we started working on with the CZI team um, was something called the Roadmap Project. It was to try to lay out what are all the paths that a, a group like any one of yours can go on to try to repurpose a drug for your rare disease. When we were repurposing serolimus for me, I didn't know what to do or where to go. We had no path or idea. And so the idea here with Roadmap, and I'm sure many of you all were part of the Roadmap Project. Thank you for completing the surveys, as Cree would say. And um, uh, thank you for being a part of those interviews. Um, but we, we spoke to 723 respondents, and we um, learned a lot about drug repurposing, how it was done in the rare disease community. And please go to that website, utilize it. It's a free tool and resource. CZI supported it, and it, it's been an amazing partnership with CZI to build that tool. And so that is all available for, for all of you to use. Um, and as I said earlier, every time I, I walk past a pharmacy or every time I think about the potential out there, I can't help but think about the untapped potential of every one of these drugs that's just sitting in your pharmacy. You know, my drug was just on my pharmacy shelf for all those years when I was in the ICU, and all we had to do was uncover that it could be a treatment for my, my horrible disease. So to just give you a, a bit of a perspective, there are about 3,000 FDA-approved drugs, and those 3,000 drugs are approved for about 3,000 human diseases. Um, but there are another about 9,000 diseases that don't have a single approved therapy. And so each one of us in this room, we have a particular disease that we're very passionate about. But if you look at this from a systems level, there's a ton of work to be done. We have a lot to be proud of as a medical community, but we've got a long way to go. And, and of these 9,000 diseases, the vast, vast majority are rare diseases, which isn't surprising, right? Because we're the neglected populations where there isn't necessarily the same financial interests. So what that means is that about one in 10 of all Americans either has or will develop a disease without a single approved therapy. One in 10. So again, we've got a lot of work to do. And so even though repurposing drugs is much faster and much less expensive than developing a new drug from scratch, cures like my own sit on the pharmacy shelf because of a number of systemic barriers that prevent them from being fully unlocked. So the first is that there's no one in the system that's responsible for making sure that drugs are fully utilized. So the FDA says yes or no when a drug company brings a drug to them for a specific disease. There's no one in charge of saying, well, what are the other diseases that this drug could potentially be useful for? Second is that there's never been a database or central repository of all of the drugs that exist and all the diseases they might be able to treat. And third, pharmaceutical companies are just not incentivized to develop new uses for existing drugs. Um, you know, once a drug becomes approved, the clock starts ticking on when that drug's gonna be off patent and attention turns towards new drugs for new diseases when you would really think, oh my gosh, the drug is approved, now is the time to really double down and find all the additional uses for it. It's important to also consider that 80% of all FDA approved drugs are already generic, which means by definition, no one is making any money off the sale of additional doses of those drugs, which means by definition, 80% of all the tools that we have as a humankind, no one's doing any research to figure out more uses for them. So we've got, we've got to fix this. Um, so, uh, Considering that, considering that I'm alive because of a repurposed drug, considering that our center um, has, has now done this a total of 16 times with drugs for diseases they weren't intended for, and then let me share a little bit more context, and that's that um, my roommate during medical school and business school, Grant Mitchell, at the time, over the last 10 years, um, had been working at McKinsey in their um, AI division, utilizing artificial intelligence to identify new uses for existing drugs. Um, and then also I got the chance to, to work with Tracy Sikora, which some of you all have met before. Tracy and I were working on a clinical trial of serolimus for Castleman disease, and we're thinking about how can we think about novel clinical trial designs so we can actually take repurposed drugs and get them into, into more patients. And then also at the same time, um, Daniel Korn was working on his PhD utilizing biomedical knowledge graphs to identify new uses for drugs. Sort of all these things came together, um, and then I guess maybe I'd say they were sort of catalyzed. Um, uh, Grant, Tracy, and I talking about, you know, we need to start an organization to fix this, this massive gap in the system, to fill this gap. Um, and right around that time, um, on March 31st of 2021, so the day before April Fool's Day, I got a phone call, um, and uh, the person on the line said, hey, um, uh, I've got President Clinton on the other line. He really wants to talk to you, read your book. And um, it was the day before April Fool's Day, so I was like <laughs> convinced it was like, you know, a friend of mine. I was like, okay, sure. Um, and uh, he has a very, you know, pronounced Little Rock, Arkansas accent, so I still thought it wasn't him for the first like five minutes of, con of the conversation. But the important takeaway from it, so he'd read my book, and he was completely struck with this idea that drugs could be used in more ways than they're currently utilized for. And he's like, wait a minute, so, wait a minute, so I spent, <laughs> so I, you know, I spent, 
you know, billions of dollars on the Human Genome Project, and you're telling me that there's additional uses for drugs and they're not being, you know, fully tapped in and patients are suffering? It's like, yeah. Um, so, 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 um, so, yeah, so, um, so really with, you know, and what President Clinton finished off by saying is that if you were to take this on, you'd have my full support and, and I'd be available to, to help you in any way that we can. And so um, that really led us to want to create on um, this organization called Every Cure. And I also wanted to share one more example before I get into Every Cure, and that's around this idea of using artificial intelligence um, on biomedical knowledge graphs to, um, to find new uses for drugs. And so, so a biomedical knowledge graph is just a visual representation of what do we know about science. So what do drugs target? What's an important gene for a given disease? And how do these things all intersect with one another? And so a really tangible one is um, with a drug called baricitinib that was discovered for COVID. And so this is just a very small snippet of a biomedical knowledge graph, but you can see how drugs, genes, uh, proteins, uh, and pathways sort of all converge. And that led to the discovery of a drug called baricitinib and its role in COVID. And it's actually FDA approved as a treatment for hospitalized patients with COVID. Um, but then there's also other diseases that um, are currently treated with baricitinib. And so you can start imagining, you can make connection after connection after connection. This is just like one little small snippet. But imagine millions and millions of nodes and edges between all of them that help you to find connections between diseases and drugs that maybe you never would have imagined. And that's what we, that's what we do through every cure. So, Every Cure is a nonprofit organization on a mission to unlock the full potential of each and every drug to treat each and every disease that it possibly can. And so at the heart of what we're doing with Every Cure, it's really pioneering an entirely new field. Um, we're trying to come up with what the name of the field is, so please give me some feedback after this. Um, uh, so you know, one of the ways we describe this field is systematic pharmacophenotyping, but let me, let me get into a bit of the, what's traditional repurposing and why does this require a new field. So traditional repurposing is where you start with a single disease like Castleman disease or the disease that you have, and you look at a specific drug that might be helpful for that disease, or maybe a number of drugs that might be helpful. So we found serolimus could be helpful for my Castleman disease. Um, there's another way to do repurposing, and that's what's often called indication expansion. This is what drug companies do. They start with a single drug, they have it approved for one disease, and they look for what are all the other diseases that might work for that given drug. So you start either with a single disease or you start with a single drug. Um, what we're doing, um, which we're terming therapeutic cross-purposing or systematic pharmacophenotyping, and I would love your feedback on, on, on the right term to use, but it's where you start with drug disease combinations, but then you look across every drug against every disease. So you don't start with just a drug or a disease you're looking across the entire pharmacophenome, so all drugs against all diseases, and then you decide what is the most promising opportunity to make an impact. And what's so exciting about this is that we can say, based on the data that exists, whether how strong a disease might be helpful, or a drug might be helpful for disease, and what's the kind of impact that will come from it, those are the ones that we will pick to then move forward into clinical trials. It doesn't matter how profitable it'll be, or how rare the disease is, or how common the disease is, it's just, What's the scientific evidence and what's the kind of impact that we can make? And it's just so exciting to be able to go in this what we call disease agnostic and drug agnostic way um, to find treatments that can save lives. So how do we do it? Um, I mentioned earlier that it's utilizing um, biomedical knowledge graphs. Um, they're biomedical knowledge graphs that actually have been built thanks to um, NCAT's funding using public data. We also were integrating in private data into that um, and also working with pharmaceutical companies to hopefully get further data that they have around diseases they considered but never pursued. Um, this is actually a real heat map. Um, this is um, the very first version we ran and we generated back in March. So every drug, every one of your diseases that in this room has a, uh, actually has a row in this particular heat map and every drug um, has, has a column. And so for every one of your diseases, there's an entire um, row just for your disease. But imagine every drug for every disease. And so every single point on this represents the likelihood that that drug is going to be effective for that disease. So we just zoomed in on one particular one where it's a 0.93 score. That's a high score. It's a zero to one scale. But imagine every drug, every disease gets a score, a total of about 36 million scores. And, uh, and we're able to sort for what are the most promising opportunities to help save lives. We're going to make all the data publicly available um, through this cure map. Um, and then we utilize the top hits to then decide which ones do we want to go further with, do we want to validate in the lab, or do we want to go right into, into using directly in, in patients. Remember, these are all already FDA-approved drugs, so they can be utilized off-label, and you can move them to trials much more quickly. Um, and then finally, um, once we do clinical trials and prove that drugs work, um, it's around ensuring the drug is accessible. So working with insurance companies to make sure that it's covered, and also working with patients and physicians to make sure that they're aware of these drugs. And in some cases, getting FDA approval, but in many cases, it won't require getting FDA approval. Um, 
Of course, if it's a new drug, you have to get FDA approval, but these are all old drugs. Um, and 20% of all prescriptions written every day are for off-label use of drugs. So every day, insurance companies are covering 20% of the time they pay for a drug that's off-label. So um, in some cases, we'll get FDA approval. In other cases, uh, we will not get FDA approval. So I mentioned we ran this back in March, and that was the first heat map that I showed for you guys. You can imagine I went to the Castleman's row, which I'm sure all of you are going to find your row for your disease, and you want to see what's the ranking. Um, and so I went to my Castleman's row. I said, what are the drugs that this algorithm predicted, you know, the most promising drugs for this disease? Um, and was interested to see adalimumab, um, which is a TNF inhibitor, as number one, and actually another TNF inhibitor as number three. Adalimumab had never been used before for Castleman disease, but based on the connections between drugs, diseases, and targets, it was prioritized as the number one hit for Castleman disease. And um, I actually got the results back on my birthday on March 29th, and it was like the greatest birthday gift ever because um, this was so exciting because we had just recently given adalimumab to a patient named Al for the first time ever. Uh, we gave a patient uh, a TNF inhibitor for Castleman disease. Alan was um, on his deathbed. He was getting ready to go in, into hospice care. And um, we had decided to give him this drug in part based on proteomics data, um, doing a similar approach to what we'd done for me. And, um, and it saved Alan's life. And uh, so to see, oh, thank you. And so for that to be the number one score, Tracy can attest. I was like running in circles in our conference room. Um, I was so excited. Um, uh, and, it's, and it is so exciting because, you know, this is, this is an algorithm that, you know, early it took about 100 days to run. Now we can run it in, like, in one day. But it's an algorithm that had no idea that this drug had been used in this patient, and it, it ranked it number one and also a similar drug number three. So um, this effort and where we've gotten so far is really um, thanks to a number of amazing partners, including Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, um, Flagship Pioneering, Elevate Prize, Lida Hill, and a number of other organizations that have jumped on board and been like, we want to fix this gap in the system. Um, and if, I mentioned earlier President Clinton. Of course, I got him doing the, the Castleman flex. Um, so, um, <laughs> So where do we go from here, and what are some lessons that we've learned? So um, the first is that there are lots of repurposing opportunities that are out there that are waiting to be uncovered. Um, when we speak to drug companies, we learn that between 30 and 40 diseases are considered for every drug that they develop, and only two to three end up getting approval for that disease. And so imagine literally dozens of additional diseases are considered but never pursued for a variety of reasons. We want to unearth those dozens of opportunities. We want to literally potentially double the impact of all of the drugs that are currently on the market and, and utilized. So there are a lot of opportunities that are waiting to be uncovered. Um, the second is that it's easy to come up with a hypothesis about how a drug might be useful in a disease. Um, it really requires um, going through and evaluating those hypotheses. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. Use our roadmap. Um, follow the approach that we've used in the past. Um, stakeholders across medicine are excited to work with you and help you, including our team um, at Every Cure. And companies are interested in providing drugs for clinical trials. So if you find a drug could be useful in a particular disease area and it's already FDA approved, they're most likely going to provide the drug to you for free for the trial. Um, we would love to partner with you. There's a few ways to do that. So one is if you have a drug um, that's already FDA approved and you think it could be useful in your disease, share that information with us. Share the data behind why you think it could be useful with us. We will integrate it into our biomedical knowledge graph. Also share with us the impact that could be made in your rare disease. Because again, for us, it's how scientific life is it to help, how much impact can it have on individuals. Share that information with us. Share the, the background data with us so we can really understand how can we prioritize your given drug disease combination versus all the other drug disease combinations. Trust me, we want to make the most impact possible. And you share that information with us will be helpful. We also, in the next few months, will be in a position to start integrating additional data from other groups. So you could share registry data and additional omics data with us. So we will, we will um, certainly let you know those, those become available. Um, and then finally, as, as we um, generate promising hits, we'd love to work with you to move those forward. So thank you all so much for your time today. So appreciate everything you all did.